Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and uh, this is a DSRV, a deep submersible rescue vehicle. It's on display in Morrow Bay at the Morrow Bay Maritime Museum. Forgive the crappy AirPod sound quality, but I, I figured that this would be a cool thing to share with you guys. So let's go and take a look at this. So this is the DSRV2 Avalon. That is a Mystic class. DSRV1 is the Mystic. Uh, it was built in the 1970s, basically uh, after the loss of the Thresher and the Scorpion, the US Navy was really interested in some sort of way to rescue people from the bottom of the ocean inside submarines. So they developed a rescue system uh, built by Lockheed Martin in Sunnyvale, California. Wait, Scott, no, it wasn't. It was built by Lockheed because Lockheed Martin didn't exist in the 1970s, but in the intervening years, Lockheed merged with Martin Marietta to create Lockheed Martin. And then, I guess when this was repainted, they may have donated some money to put their logo on it. Also note, Draper Laboratory on there. Draper built the computer and control systems for this, which were closely related to those used for the Apollo Guidance computer. You see, there is a spaceflight link in this video. Anyway, back to old me. So uh, the construction is that you've got this big uh, cylindrical uh, fairing, I guess. Inside, you can actually see that the pressure hull is a sphere, right? There's three spheres, one the front for the pilots and then two at the back for the actual uh, rescue ease. So it could carry uh, two crew to pilot the thing, a couple of uh, people to help with the rescue system, and it can carry 24 for people needing rescued. And they actually demonstrated this underwater, right? This was never actually used for real, but it was used in a number of exercises to demonstrate this capability. Up the front, this is a sonar dome. So it had uh, all sorts of sonar capabilities. These are vertical thruster channels up here. And you have light systems and horizontal thrusters here, right? So again, coming down, we have uh, the docking system here, which I will explain in a bit. And then at the back, you again have a pair of uh, thrusters, vertical and horizontal, and the big main propulsion system. Top speed was about four to five knots. It was powered by silver zinc batteries, the finest of 1970s technology. So yeah, I think it was built in the 70s, went into, it got its name in 1977 and uh, remained in service until 2000. Then of course the DSRV Mystic, that was taken out of service in 2008. They've since been replaced by more modern systems. Uh, the main difference is that the more modern systems are able to handle decompression better. So uh, the idea is this little dinky sub is small enough that it could be loaded onto a C5 Galaxy it would actually take three galaxies to, to move things around. You would have, uh, I think it was a C, yeah, C5 anyway. Wait a second, Scott. According to the manual, it says it's supposed to be loaded onto a C141 Starlifter, but the only photos I could find were of it being loaded onto a C5 Galaxy and the occasional Antonov. One would carry the sub. Second one would carry the uh, trailer and other support equipment needed to attach it to a sub. And then there would be a uh, final one carrying like the trailer that had all the control hardware, the support hardware to keep this thing running. It would lock onto a cradle on the back of a submarine and it would basically be able to transfer crew between a submarine and a downed vessel. So the museum does actually have the submarine cradle, uh, but it's not on display. It's sort of sitting out in a back lot unmarked somewhere. The submarine cradle allows the DSRV to attach to the back of a larger submarine that it can use as a mothership. And the reason why you might use a submarine as a mothership is, say you're trying to rescue crew from a downed submarine, which is underneath an ice shelf, then you can't use a surface ship, so you have to have something that can come under the ice with the rescue vehicle and provide a place to receive the survivors and to recharge the DSRV between trips. Now, you probably have seen me talk about docking systems on spacecraft. This is completely different. What this is, it's just like a hemisphere, and down underneath, there's like an O-ring. On that, it's just a flat surface, you know, spacecraft, of course, they have all these complex locking systems to lock the two things together, align them, and uh, then pressurize the system. This is just like a flat plane, which sits up against a flat hull. 
And then as they remove the water from this, the water pressure pushes the two sides together. See, in space, you don't have that water pressure. You have to actually lock everything together instead. That ring with the hydraulics, that is a, like a, that's like a bumper that basically, um, when they are docking with it, they put that on the hull and then they retract it slowly while thrusting downwards and then they lock against the hull. And then there's some cool stuff that goes on here. So they start pumping the water out of there. And once they reach P, uh, 15 PSI below ambient, the pump stalls because it takes a lot of energy to pump water out. So once they reach that, they then switch the pump over to pump it into an internal tank. Uh, and that way they actually don't need to expend nearly as much energy removing the pressure here. So once that's in, once that's locked in, they can open the hatch on both sides and people can actually move through. So the, another sort of interesting pumping trick is that once you start taking on survivors, guess what? You need to deal with the ballast, right? The sub is no longer, well, it's gonna, the sub is gonna get heavier and heavier and it wants to remain buoyancy neutral. So there's actually internal ballast tanks inside the rescue uh, spheres. These are like big, big nylon bags that contain uh, water. And as they take on survivors, they just let the water flow down into the submarine they're rescuing from and therefore keep the ballast the same. So, you know, these are a couple of things that they have to do to make the operations work correctly. So I did actually get permission to get underneath the vessel and take a look at the you know, mating sphere and the docking collar here. This hatch opens outwards so that it's normally held shut by the pressure of the water. Once they've reduced the pressure inside this area and drained the water, that's when they can finally open this hatch. Similarly, the corresponding hatch in the escape trunk of the submarine would also open outwards, so it won't be able to open until the pressure has been reduced either. And the fact that both hatches will need room to open up uh, explains why the rescue, the, the mating hemisphere, is so large. Around the hatch, you can also see various connectors which would be used to recharge the sub between excursions. It would take about an hour to recharge the batteries, to refill the ballast tanks and the compressed air systems, and of course to offload the 24 rescuees. See, as I said, there's three spherical pressure hulls here and they're all joined by individual hatches. That meant that you could have different pressures, which is important because in some cases you might be rescuing people from pressurized environments that they might have to go through decompression. So they could actually have the pilots be at one atmosphere pressure and then the back two spheres could be at five atmospheres pressure, say, and they could actually rescue people and decompress them in a safe manner. Uh, that is uh, something that was quite difficult, but it was still a potential uh, something they could do. Uh, you understand that there's no pressure hull in this section. This is all equipment here. And uh, again, the section at the back, there's that's all equipment there. It's like uh, several hundred kilos of batteries and uh, you know, sensors, sonar. This had a robotic manipulator system because when it got down to the, uh, to the target, it might have to cut stuff away to get access. So there's a robotic manipulator just in front of the uh, just in front of the docking system here. So they could use that with, uh, you know, cameras and uh, tools so that they could clear away access to a hatch and therefore then move in for the docking and recovery process. When you get in close, it's easier to see the, the construction. You can see the, the spheres and the thin outer layer of uh, fiberglass and framing. Also note that the windows appear to have been removed at some point. Perhaps somebody took them as a souvenir. I mean, I expect that these things were easy to remove and reattach because they were, you know, things that could might might get bumped. Now, if you move over to like the forward section, you can see that is the pilot area there. That's the sphere which the crew would be in. And that stainless steel sphere there, that is the forward ballast tank. That's the one that would be used to uh, de-ballast the a tunnel. But understand that the nose and tail sections didn't have people in them. They had hardware, they had batteries, sensors, you know, all that kind of thing. It was capable, I think, of depths of about 5,000 feet. Now, they originally wanted to build a dozen of these, but you know, partway through the project, they sort of realized that actually 
Submarines sinking in most of the Earth's ocean will quickly descend below their crush depth and not be recoverable. So it certainly cut down the amount of ocean that they needed to cover. Secondly, it ended up being able to carry more people, so they decided to only build two of them. And it was never really needed in the end for its rescue role. Although all these capabilities with cameras and sonar and manipulators makes you wonder if there were other jobs for which it was well suited. It would be a perfect cover story, right? If you wanted to uh, perform some kind of espionage operations with this vessel. So let's talk about the sub's control systems and the link to the Apollo program via Draper Labs. Like the Apollo spacecraft, the sub needed to have full six degree of freedom control. It needed to be able to cruise towards a target and once it got there, hold position, rotate to act, you know, match the orientation and then move in, dock and mate with great precision. For the mating operation, it needed to hold a precise attitude in roll and pitch because, of course, the target vessel may be stranded on the seafloor and unable to hold a perfect vertical attitude. So there is a mercury ballast trim system which pumps mercury around between a number of vessels to allow adjustment of the centre of mass. So when you combine that with the five bi-directional motors, you can achieve control in all six axes. Those are mapped to, through two hand controllers, which can switch between translation mode and cruise mode. And the translation of the hand controllers to actual operations in the motors or the ballast system is of course carried out by a computer. It is a fly-by-wire system, except that it's actually underwater. Now this came a few years after the development of the Apollo guidance computer. It was built by the same people and there was some sources which suggested they had actually just taken two Apollo guidance computers and smashed them together to make one more powerful computer. While there's probably some shared heritage here, I don't think that's the case because first of all, there's sources I found which tell us that the data word size was 20 bits whereas Apollo used 15. And uh, the number format is two's complement rather than one's complement. So there's definitely some architectural changes here. So the central processing computer was split into two logical parts which operated separately. There was the digital differential analyzer and all it did was it took in data from the navigation sensors and everything and it would compute the equations of motion. It would figure out the vehicle state vector very quickly and then that would pass it on to other things to make decisions. And so yeah, then there was the general purpose computer which would run more complex decisions but it wouldn't run as quickly. Both of these used core memory, but unlike the Apollo guidance computer, the software was loaded from tape. I would love to know more about this, especially if there is any commonality with the Apollo hardware, but I'm not holding out much hope. The data, as I said, it's on tape. It's probably not recoverable at this point. There's only two examples in the world. There's no documentation. It was a military project. But it was 1960s era computer technology that continued to operate into the 21st century. Maybe there's some more documentation out there. Uh, I did get a look at some of the you know archives that the museum have in their uh, stores. So I'm going to say thanks to Scott at the Morro Bay Maritime Museum, who was eager to tell me all about this, and I was all ears. Pay it a visit if you are in the area. So yeah, that's a DSRV2 Avalon. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.